Genesis 1, let's look at verse 20 again. And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And the break, Brian kind of, you know, just kind of threw a question mark. And he said, Hey, Greg, hey, the fowl of the air? From the water? From the ocean? Now, This is where you kind of, you have to be careful here how you read this because it reads at first like these things are coming out of the ocean or that they're ocean faring beings, okay? And that's not what it means. The essence here is that the ocean is teeming with life, the ocean environment. That includes the beaches, the islands, and those sorts of things. Now, at this point in time, you didn't have islands, you just had one massive continent, okay? But you still had coastline. So if you think about this, now we live close to Gulf Shores and a lot of people around here go down to the beach quite often. What's that? Not close enough? Yeah, the Lord could just kind of bring it a little bit closer, right? Um, But there's all kinds of ocean life that they have there that we don't have here. Okay, so for example, I don't see many, if any, seagulls up here. Do we have seagulls around here? We do? Go to Target. They're at Target. Those are pigeons. (laughs) Yeah, no... But but you have you have ocean life that is more tuned to that environment. You've got certain species of birds like an albatross, pelicans, things like that that are saltwater beings and things like that. And so it does, again, the idea here is not that they're coming out of the water or that they live in the water, but it is more that sea life. It's, it's like everybody has the stickers on their cars now. It's salt life, you know. It's um, that's kind of the idea here. It's teeming with life. Okay, and then we get to verse 21. And it says here, And God created great whales, and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good, and God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. All right. Just to kind of bring you up to speed on this, and this is, this is I'm titling this the Truman Issue, okay? Um, from the start of the study, I've, I've made the claim that God created all the matter from, the, from minute number one. Okay, all matter, okay? Um, and, and then He formed everything from that matter after that, okay? Including life, all right? And so you don't have the creative act after this moment like you did here. Okay? When I say that, creating something out of nothing. Okay? Now, the challenge to that is verse 21 because what does it say? God created great whales. Okay? So if my claim is going to stand, I've got to somehow defend it, right? And so... Here's the thing. So, Truman, to your point, the same Hebrew word that you get in verse 1, he created, is the Hebrew word bara, okay? That is the exact same word you have right here in verse 21. God created, okay? Um, And so it's the exact same Hebrew word. But does this mean the pattern breaks down with whales? Uh, yeah, dude, I really like this thing that I've created in my mind and invented called whales. And I ran out of stuff to use. So I've got, yeah, I've got to bring it out of nothing. I'm making light of the, the topic. I don't mean to do that. Um, so again, and this is the case with a lot of Bible words and really just any language. You can have one word that has a variation of meaning and that's not trying to dance around the issue. It just is what it is, okay? And we're going to see that. Now, uh, in verse 21 here, it says, And God created great whales. That word created is, again, if you look up just a pure definition of it, is to create. It can mean to shape. It can mean to form. It can mean to fashion. It can mean to mold. Okay? So it does have a variation of meaning. We generally hear the word create, and especially in the Genesis account, we assume instantly it only means something out of nothing. Okay, And this has been why I think for a lot of people the Genesis account has been so problematic 
is because we make assumptions like that that we can't support. You know, so, um, for example, and I was just talking with someone about this a minute ago, when you get to verse 2, and it says, "...and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters." And you're like, well, where did the waters come from all of a sudden? Well, he must have just spoken into existence. You know? And so you, we have to explain that somewhere. Um, but, but, but this word create, it, it, it has a variation of meaning there to create, to shape, to form, to fashion. And he, by the way, we see this with other parts of God's creation, that God formed them from the material creation. Look at chapter 2, verse 19. Uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 19. Now remember what happened on day 5. God made whales and the fowl of the air that are, you know, essentially sea environment birds, okay? So look what he says here in Genesis chapter 2. Uh, come to verse, uh, where am I at? Verse 19. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and what? What does your translation say, Cotton? You have got to get an authorized version of the King James Bible, man. I'm going to tell you right now, that Holman Christian Standard, especially when you get over into 2 Timothy and Paul's talking about a little wine for your stomach, you know what the Holman Christian Standard does? Because the Southern Baptists produced that when they had a political agenda. They changed it from saying from wine to no strong drink or beer. You can look it up. And the reason why is because the Southern Baptists have a problem with alcohol. Now, I'm not trying to tell everybody to go out and go buy some alcohol. But this is what happens with a lot of your modern translations. They get a political agenda. <laughs> Look, Cotton, I'm not trying to come down with you on a hammer, but hey, I appreciate your commentary. It's terrible, okay? Uh, go get your King James Bible. But, uh, but anyway, so right here, verse 19, it says, And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And what's of Adam called? Every living creature, that was the name thereof. Now, did God create every fowl of the air? What does it say there? From where? <laughs> okay. So it's not create in the sense of speaking it into existence something out of nothing, is it? Okay. Uh, go with me. Uh, take a right to hold your place in Genesis because we'll come back to it for sure. Go with me to Proverbs uh, chapter 26. Proverbs chapter 26. That's right. We'll get to that. Proverbs chapter 26. Good job. Brian is on it. He is on it. Proverbs chapter 26. Proverbs chapter 26, read verse 10. Proverbs 26, verse 10. Cotton, I'm really curious. <laughs> what do the Baptists say about this? <laughs> That's what your verse 10 says? Just verse 10? I can see where they get the second half. Alright, so Cotton, here, you ready? You ready? Yours didn't even go anywhere close. Verse 10. The great God that formed all things both rewardeth the fool and rewardeth transgressors. Yeah. Um... <laughs> Cotton's like, I'm not lying to y'all. I know you're not lying. I'm trying to tell you. That Bible, you need to throw it in the garbage can. All right. So, I, this sounds, y'all, I'm Cotton. Hey, Cotton. Cotton, we're buddies, man. I'll, ch I'll, I'll cheer for Auburn next week, okay? I promise you. Hey, I mean, I've been, yeah, oh, I know. I've been scratching my head. Yeah. I think the Holman Christian Standard, if I'm not mistaken, the Holman Christian Standard was published in 2010. I'm not going to say release the first edition came because I was in a seminary when they were producing that thing. It was funded by the Southern Baptist Convention, published by Lifeway and the Nelson Group, but it was with a Southern Baptist agenda. And and I and I I'm not trying to be mean spirited, but I will say this: number one, the text 
from which they translated had problems, but then also the doctrinal perspective through which the lens they, through which they looked at when they looked at that text was not a rightly divided perspective, and that creates problems. And you see, you get all kinds of issues there. So, but it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm being a meanie. And I, I tell you what, I'm probably going to have to buy you lunch one day just to apologize. And so, yeah. You like steak? All right. <coughs> hey, Brian. <laughs> say again now. Yeah, what's the non inspired version say? Like an archer who wounds at random is one who hires a wolf or any That's verse 10. Again, are y'all seeing why I wanted to call out verse 10? For the very first phrase, and what does the very first phrase say? The very first phrase is, The great God that formed all things. Proverbs chapter 26, verse 10, the first part says, The great God that formed all things. Okay? Again, um, when we think of God creating great whales, does that have to mean He spoke whales? And all of a sudden, poof, you know, Okay, I think that scenario, when we get out here to day five, the creating great whales is, at least that process is radically different than what we had right here. Okay, um, from, a, from just a basic molecular standpoint, okay, if we looked at the, the, the stuff of whales under a microscope, from our observation, it will look very similar to other sea creatures. Okay, um, it, it's not that it was some unique material. You know, as Caleb said, like he looked at all this material that he created back here and went, "Ah, I missed on this. I need to. I need to make something more here." And so, I'm no Truman wasn't necessarily saying that, but nonetheless. Okay, and then the bronze point. Come back to Genesis one. You know, again, and I've said this before. A lot of this study of Genesis, and this is really the case in any Bible study, but certainly is the case in Genesis. It seems to slap us in the face more in, in the creation account. Learn to challenge the assumptions. Learn to question your thoughts about it. Not just to tear yourself down to where you're so confused, but so that way you can kind of break free and say, okay, now I'm free to actually see what it says. You know, um, I could have stopped short at gap theory. I could have stopped short at ba Big Bang. I could have stopped short at evolutionary theory and all these other things. I don't even know what other theories are out there or what they're called. I'm sure there's more. Um, but I'm not, personally, I, I, I'm not tasked with being the best scientist. Okay? I, I'm tasked with presenting the Word of God as it is. And, and really, you as a Bible student are tasked with, with discovering and learning and growing in the Word as it is. You know, and so it's it, this is beneficial for us. Look at Genesis one verse twenty six, and God said, "Let us do what." What does yours say, God? Okay, you got it right there. Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God did what? Created man. Now, in verse 26, He made them, but in verse 27, He's creating them. Okay? Now, just from the, the juxtaposition of those two verses there, we already see that there is a, a shade to the word created that is unique. This idea of making. Okay? We've seen, when you couple that with Proverbs 26, the idea of forming is a shade of that. Okay? Um, but there's this, there's this side by side of making and created. But when we get over into chapter 2, go with me to chapter 2 and look at verse 7, we get further detail here. Now, let me pause here and say this. We are assuming that the creation of humanity in chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, is the same as chapter 2. Rita really likes that. Mm hmm He's got her tenfold hat on now. We're, here's what I mean. We're assuming that chapter 1 is just this broad statement about creating humankind, like he created plant kind or animal kind, and then we come to chapter 2 and we're going to sort of zero in and then really start with the nitty-gritty. We're assuming that. 
I think that's a safe assumption for now. That being what it is, that being what it is, look at chapter 2 regarding the making and creating of mankind. Look what it says in verse 7. Uh, and the Lord God formed man, by the way, read a man here is the Hebrew word Adam or Adam, where we get the name Adam, but it literally means mankind. Same here as it was back in chapter one, if you're wanting to do a word study in comparison there. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Um, look at verse 8. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there He put the man whom He had what? Formed. Okay. Back in chapter 1, verse 26, when God, or verse 27, when God created man in His image, did He speak him into existence something from nothing? That doesn't appear to be what the text is teaching us. Apparently, He took the matter that He made back here, that He created from nothing here, and used it to form out there, okay? As we have seen and appears to be consistent in the other portions of the creation account. Go with me to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. Cotton, I love you, brother. I'm scared. I'm scared that I. I'm scared that I. <laughs> I hurt your feelings, man. All right, uh, Romans chapter nine, verse twenty. Paul says, Nay, but O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Now look at this next phrase. Shall the thing what formed? Say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? You see how Paul uses the word made here, coupling that with forming. All right. Um, again, God formed man. Uh, look with me, go to, with me to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy. First Timothy chapter two. Uh, let's see. I'm in Thessalonians. That's why I didn't. I was reading. I was like, that ain't right. All right. Um, First Timothy chapter two. Look at verse thirteen. <laughs> How's that read, Truman? Then Eve. Okay. I mean, that goes without saying. Now, again, you could say, well, okay, yeah, we get that he formed Adam and Eve, he formed man, but back there in Genesis on the fifth day, he's creating whales. Okay? And you could decide in your mind to say, he must really like whales. God is really fixated on whales, you know. And, and by the way, they do crop up from time to time in the Bible, you know what I'm saying? And so it's like, did he really just have that kind of love for whales? <laughs> I'm kind of being, this is sort of the argument from absurdity. I'm, I'm trying to make light of it, not, not to be irreverent, but to say, it kind of sounds absurd that when you put it in those terms, right? Instead, what I'm trying to do is is say, the way he's using the word created has this variation of meaning and we see it elsewhere in Scripture. And so you get this precedent where it says the word created can also mean to be formed or to make or to produce or to shape and all these other things. And so do we have precedent to say when he created wells, it's not that he's speaking a well into existence from nothing. Or is he actually staying consistent with the quote-unquote pattern here and forming it from the material that he has from the start? Okay, um, and so the the creative act, as we can see here, is is accomplished in different ways. All right, uh, go with me to Isaiah chapter forty one. Isaiah chapter forty one.
Isaiah chapter 41. Uh, Come on down to uh, verse 18. Isaiah 41, and then uh, starting in verse 18. I will open rivers and high places and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. I will plant in the wilderness the cedar, the shittah tree, and the myrtle, and the oil tree. I will set in the desert the fir tree, and the pine, and the box tree together, that they may see, and know, and consider, and understand together, that the hand of the Lord hath done this, and the Holy One of Israel hath what? Created it. Now, when you think of God creating this oasis in a desert place, does that mean He looks at the desert and He goes... Oasis. And then also, bloop, 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 bloop. Palm trees and cedar trees and a, a, you know, a pool of water or whatever it may be. Okay? Uh, it's certainly not the case where he's creating these things for the first time. We've already got those particular kinds of plant life. Okay? But notice it says they're by the hand. So number one, it's not by the voice. It's by the hand. Okay? Now, a lot of times what you see in Hebrew, and I need to do a word study on this, we're talking about the hand of the Lord creating something, depending on the tense of the verb, or the, the, it's not really the tense, the, the kind of verb that it is, many times you'll see that it is a causative stem, or what they call hifil. And so what it means is that when it says He created, the very literal interpretation there is He caused it to be created. Um, a good example of this is at the Tower of Babel when it says he confounded their language. It is a causative stem there, which means he caused their languages to be confounded. What does that mean? Did he very literally reach down with his finger and kind of stir their vocal cords and mix them all up in their brain? Or, or what did he do? Somehow or another, he caused it. And so, you know, could that mean he sent a wind along? And it blew spores and seedlings in the air and they landed in this desert place. And he's, he blew a cloud over the desert to create some rain. I mean, he can, he's got control of it all, right? But nonetheless, what we see here is God's creative acts can happen in a lot of different ways, a lot of different methods. It doesn't always mean, as we traditionally have thought about God's creative acts, as Him just speaking something into existence, right? Um, Go with me to Isaiah 43. <clears throat> and it's, it's not always just physical things or tangible things, things you can touch that God's creating. I mean, He can create all kinds of things. Um, Isaiah chapter 43, look at verse 1. But now, thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob. Now, is he talking about Jacob literally, the person? I don't believe so. I believe here Jacob, he's, he's referring to Israel, as in the nation Israel, which, by the way, he formed. <laughs> and it says, But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. Verse 7, Even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory, I have formed him, yea, I have made him. Again, you see there the combination of created with the word formed. I think this is a consistent theme that you're seeing throughout. Go to chapter 45. Isaiah chapter 45, look at verse 7. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. I know that brings up all kinds of questions, right? We'll have to come back to that. But just understand here, again, that juxtaposition of create and form. All right? Um, Look at verse 12. I have made the earth and created man upon it. Now, we know when it says here He created man upon it, we know how He created it, right? Right? He formed it from the dust of the earth. Okay, and then He breathed life into it. That was His creative act. And it says, uh, I even my hands have stretched out the heavens and all their hosts have I commanded. And then look at uh, verse 18. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God Himself that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. So, to kind of come back to Genesis chapter 1 now, and again, I'm not saying that Truman was trying to throw shade on this or anything like that or say, hey, Greg, your theory is stupid. 
Okay, although he may think that, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> this idea that all of a sudden we come to day five and it says all of a sudden that God created whales. I do not believe that means all of a sudden he was either caught off guard or like he had such a fixation on whales that he felt like this needed to be a special creation. Um, I do believe just in a, in a very biblical sense that word created has that variation of meaning there. And I, I very literally mean, think it means that he formed them. He molded them, you know. And what a magnificent creature, by the way. Has anybody here ever seen a whale? I, the, I think the closest is when Claire and I were heading on our home and we, we were coming in as we were landing. We went to Cancun. And as we're flying in, the water's there, crystal clear. And I could see... I'm assuming it was it was either a whale or the most enormous shark on earth. And it it was big but I could just make out the dark outline of it in the water, but that was better. But I mean I I've never seen one in real life, but I assume it's a big it as the Bible says, God created great whales. Okay? And so anyway, uh, again, I think the the pattern remains consistent. He had the creative act of something from nothing, and then the formation, the sorting, and the identifying, the formation, the sorting, the identifying, the formation, the sorting, the identifying, the formation, the sorting. And, and this carries on even as we get to the nation Israel. You get the formation, you get the sorting them out from all the other nations of the earth, and then you get the identifying them with Him, okay? And so um, that pattern remains consistent, I believe.